Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Aero 3271 Lecture 24A on Aircraft Loads, Limit and Ultimate Load Factors. There are a number of loads that occur on aircraft during flight. Air loads, landing loads, power plant loads, takeoff loads, and then a number of special cases. A common aircraft coordinate system is shown here. Often X is chosen in the longitudinal direction, usually X is positive aft, so fuselage stations get larger as you move aft. Y is uh, chosen to one side. Often Z is chosen as positive down, which means positive X rolling into the Y following the right hand rule places the Z axis downward. That's not completely global, but that's very common. And then we talk about aircraft control. We talk about the roll axis, the pitch axis, and the yaw axis. And uh, you probably learned a little bit about this in some of our introductory aero classes. When an aircraft moves through the air, the aircraft always has its weight pulling it toward the center of the earth. And that weight is propelled with the thrust from the engines. The thrust is resisted by the drag and the weight is countered by the lift on the wing. The wing is shaped so that as the thrust pushes the aircraft through the air, the airflow over the wing results in a positive load distribution or pressure distribution that causes lift. It also causes some drag and the faster you go the more drag you have. As you apply more thrust, you accelerate forward, and as the airflow flows over the wing, it generates drag that resists that and lift. When your lift exceeds your weight, you begin to accelerate up into the air until the aircraft is leveled off. When the aircraft is undergoing horizontal flight, then the weight will perfectly balance, be perfectly balanced by the lift. Actually, that word perfectly is a little too strong because what happens is there's a slight imbalance in order to provide stability since the CG of the aircraft is just forward of the center of lift so there will be a downward force on the tail that develops also with a function of speed and that provides that stabilizing force. The drag also increases as you speed up and when you're at a horizontal flight with constant speed, your thrust will be perfectly balanced by the drag on the aircraft. So the weight is pulling the aircraft down, the thrust is pushing it forward, the imbalance of forces is causing acceleration, the air resistance resists that as well, giving lift and drag components and the aircraft becomes airborne. The pilot moves the control surfaces such as the ailerons and the elevators and other control surfaces in order to control the flight and to maneuver the aircraft. So it's important to understand internal and external loads. When we talk about these weight, lift, CG, these forces that are acting on the aircraft like the thrust and the resistance to the thrust, the weight, these are basically can, can be considered external loads. The internal loads are when we make a section cut of the aircraft and start cutting members, structural members, and looking at the forces in each of those. We're going to need to be masters of both of these ideas and we've explored different pieces of that throughout our journey in structures. Now there are a number of prescribed factors of safety. FAR 25303 prescribes what they are for commercial aircraft. Civil aircraft, commercial aircraft typically have a factor of safety of 1.5. Rotorcraft also typical factor of safety is 1.5 and then launch vehicles can have various numbers. These numbers are fairly low because we need to fly, we need to be able to get off the ground and it becomes cost prohibitive if they aren't low. The reason they're not even lower is because we need to have a measure of safety because the understanding of the loads is limited and the stress analysis is limited. You've already seen a number of approximations we make variations of materials and other things. For our purposes, while this shows a few factors of safety you might run into, for aircraft we can basically assume that the uh, factor of safety we will use is 1.5.
Now in many disciplines, what they do is take the loads that are applied and evaluate against the allowable to come up with a factor of safety. But since the airworthiness authority requires a factor of safety to be an all structural analysis, what we do in aerospace is bury that factor of safety in the loads. So when you get the loads from the loads group at an aircraft company, it generally will have that factor already in, in it. And if it doesn't, you need to apply it. And then you'll do all analysis with it. And we will write a margin of safety on the factor loads. There are a number of weight designations that are used in aircraft, like the max gross weight of the aircraft. That's the fully loaded weight that includes all structures, passengers, and everything else. The max ramp weight is a similar number, which includes things that will not be required after you taxi the aircraft and move the aircraft around before you try and get off the ground that can be used that's appropriate. The max takeoff weight draws our attention to the idea that the aircraft is going to need is going to burn a certain amount of fuel just trying to get off the runway and so while you can use that max gross weight to do all analysis, you can look and say, well, actually we can use the max takeoff weight when we take off because takeoff has a number of critical load factors that are very high and not that high at other times in flights. The max weight that can actually happen if you start off with a fully loaded aircraft and then burn a minimum amount of fuel while you're trying to get off the runway. Max zero fuel weight is the weight of the structure of the aircraft and payload once the fuel is gone. This is important for some of the dynamic effects. Uh, sometimes you get higher load factors when you have that max zero fuel weight. While for many load cases the max gross weight is more critical, there are a few load cases where the max zero fuel weight is. Max landing weight draws our attention to the fact that in order to get off the ground, get in the air, and then land, you are going to probably have a lot less weight than you took off with. And it's curious that some aircraft are designed such that they can't even land as soon as they take off without jettisoning fuel or passengers or something else. So we're going to use for our purposes a factor of safety of 1.5 on all analysis. Now usually when I ask you a structural question you're just assuming that you're analyzing that number so we would have assumed that that factor is already buried in there. When you're doing your own design analysis like for Dr. Egberg's class uh, and things like that you're going to need to make sure that you have applied that factor of safety to your loads. But there are other loads and load factors that are done in industry. In fact the generation of, the, you know, of loads for the aircraft is a very complicated thing that usually aircraft companies have a very specific and specialized group for doing that kind of things. However, a lot of times there are limits to those numbers, like the FAR requirements designate a bunch of ways to calculate what load factors are appropriate, but then for commercial aircraft it sets, it says that your load factor doesn't have to exceed 3.8 G. So you can either do analysis to show what it actually is, or you can just analyze to that max 3.8 G downward load factor and 1 G upward load factor. So what we're going to need to do when we're designing aircraft is first to select a load factor. Rather than teach you a bunch of methods for calculating precisely the load factor, we're just going to grab that max load factor. And then we're going to need to apply our factor of safety. When we're analyzing to limit loads, which is done for some cases, we're going to be watching to make sure that our structure doesn't yield or have permanent deformation. When we're analyzing the ultimate loads, we're going to multiply those max loads that we see, which means the max load that we have, like the max gross weight, times the max load factor, which we can say is 3.8 G's down and 1 G up, and the factor of safety 1.5. If you take these three numbers, multiply them together, that's going to give you a conservative estimate of the load that needs to be applied to the aircraft. So we can just, for our purposes, say, okay, we're going to use a factor of safety of 1.5, a download factor of 3.8, and an upload factor of 1.0, multiply by the max gross weight, and that should be conservative for our inertial loading. Now that actually doesn't cover our gust loads. It often will be greater than most of the gust loads. There are some gust loads that may exceed this value. So when you're analyzing for industry, you're going to need to do a little more 
but for our purposes we are just going to use this as a simplification of what needs to be done. Now the FAR 25301 which is for wide body commercial aircraft says that the limit loads which are specified by the FAR requirements 20, FAR 25301 for commercial wide body aircraft says that the structure must be able to withstand the limit loads without detrimental permanent deformation. The limit loads are just the maximum loads anticipated, which we said would be the max gross weight times the load factor, which will either be 3.8 Gs down or 1 G up. That analysis, when we do that kind of analysis, what that means is if we're making sure we don't have detrimental permanent deformation, we often will just analyze to the yield calculate those limit loads and then compare the stresses to the yield. For ultimate loads what we're going to do is take those limit loads which is the max load factor times the max gross weight and then multiply by the ultimate factor of safety of 1.5. We then will show that the structure can withstand it when we compare the stresses that we calculate against FTU. Another approach is just to go and test the structure to show that even though analytically the stresses exceed FTU, the structure can hold the ultimate load without failure for at least three seconds. A lot of interior structures are analyzed this way because the load paths are really usually not ideal for structures. They're designed for other purposes and that makes it very difficult to predict the stresses accurately and to actually be good. They have a lot of failures and so often they will just test until it's good. So if we want to summarize our approach for developing loads then we're going to start by figuring out what I'm calling our baseline loads and we're going to use the max gross weight for our purposes. That's either correct or conservative. We're then going to determine our load factor unless we're specified otherwise we're going to assume it's 3.8 G's down and 1 G up. This applies to wide body aircraft, commercial aircraft. If you have smaller aircraft then you can get some higher factors. We then are going to determine our baseline loads which is just that load factor times the max gross weight. We're then going to analyze our structure to those. We're going to compare any stresses of the baseline loads when we apply our limit factor of safety which is usually 1.0 and make sure that we get no negative margin when comparing to FTY and that we don't get any detrimental permanent de de uh, deformation. And that explains that here. Then we're going to analyze to ultimate loads. This is where most of the analysis of aircraft structures is done. So what we do is take those baseline loads, multi multiply them by the ultimate factor of safety of 1.5. Usually the load factor doesn't have that little U subscript. I applied that to try and be clearer with you guys. That gives us our max ultimate loads shown here. And then we can analyze and compare to FTU and we need to make sure that no failures occur. You can have yielding, you can have stability problems as long as you demonstrate that the full ultimate loads can be held by the structure. That is a brief overview of how to calculate simplified loads on aircraft. Now that you know how to get the factored loads you need to look at this video 24B to learn how to distribute those loads in a simple and approximate way. You're also going to want to review the lecture video 22B from Arrow 3261. We covered this in Arrow 3261 and that video has been posted here as well. Be sure to watch that so you can do that also.